my citizens that it is indeed uh, a safe way of disposing of these, this low-level waste. Reprise de continuing debate to the Honourable Member for Saanich, Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise tonight to participate in the debate on uh, Bill C-69. And this, is, this debate has been treated by some speakers as a debate on the whole budget. That's fair enough. It is the Budget Implementation Act. I certainly appreciated very much the remarks by my colleague, the Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre, moments ago, who focused on some aspects of C-69 and the budget that I won't be able to uh, address in, in my remarks. In the time I have available, I want to dive deeply into one part of Bill C-69. Now, for those who are um, in, in this, who are observing tonight's debate, perhaps I can just back up and say this is what's called a, an omnibus budget bill. It's exactly the kind of, of bill that in the 2015 election platform by the Liberals, they said we, that they would not be using. Uh, this is an omnibus budget bill and in that it deals with many, many aspects of things that are in the budget and particularly uh, a reference in the budget uh, to the court case on impact assessment legislation. So what we have tucked into a bill that's over 400 pages is from pages 555 to 581, a section that I don't believe should be in there. Be very, very clear from the start. This is a rewriting of substantial sections of the Impact Assessment Act. The irony is probably not lost on people who've tracked the debate on environmental assessment in this country, that when the Liberals uh, brought in repairs to the environmental assessment legislation that they had promised would be done in the election platform of 2015, that bill was also called Bill C-69. I voted against that one. I'll be voting against this one, too. And in this speech is my effort to try to persuade government members, and particularly the Minister of Environment and Minister of Justice, to rethink things, to pull what's called Part 4, Division 28 of Bill C-69, and instead bring in what was promised in 2015, repairing what, what, happened, what had happened to our impact assessment legislation, usually called environmental assessment legislation in this country. I don't have much time to set this out, so forgive me for taking the time it takes to explain that from 1975, when this country held its first federal environmental assessment, ironically of the um, <laughs> Rec Cove Hydro Project in my home province of Nova Scotia, in my home island of Cape Breton Island, and I attended those hearings, the very first ones in 1975 of the Rec Cove Hydro Project. The federal government at that time were, was operating under something called the Environmental Assessment Review Process, a guidelines order by order in council to the federal cabinet. It set out basically that when the federal government did something, the federal government reviewed its own, its own actions. There's no question of constitutionality because the federal government was reviewing its own actions. So the, the rule under the guidelines order was if it was on federal land, involved federal money, or permits given under certain kinds of acts, you had to have an environmental assessment. That general formulation went into the drafting in the late 1980s under the government of the former late Right Honorable Brian Mulroney to an environmental assessment process that again started with those four corners of federal jurisdiction. Is it on federal land involving federal money and evolved into something called the law list, permits given under various acts. This whole scheme worked very well. It evolved. There were many amendments over the years. It had a five-year review process. By the time 2012 rolled around, you could talk to almost anyone in the industry. It was predictable. The Mining Association of Canada, for instance. I remember the, e the CEO there, Pierre Gratton, saying, why are the Conservatives trying to wreck this act now? We've just finally got it right. We like the way it works. So we had Federal Environmental Assessment Act brought in under Brian Mulroney, enacted under former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. It had evolved over the years. And in the spring of 2012, 
in an omnibus budget bill called Bill C-38. The government of former Prime Minister Stephen Harper set out to destroy this legislation. Well, they repealed it in its entirety. It was repealed. And it was replaced with something called SIA 2012. And at the same time, they also went after the pieces of legislation that triggered environmental assessment, the law list sections, the Fisheries Act, the Navajo Waters Protection Act, and so on. Now, in the, to, to fast forward, in the election of 2015, the Liberals promised in the platform to repair and fix what had been done by Harper to environmental assessment, to the Fisheries Act, to the Navajo Waters Protection Act. And in 2016 and 2017, various ministers went to work. Uh, the current Minister for Public Safety was then Minister of Fisheries and actually did fix the Fisheries Act, got it back to what it had been before, and even improved it. The former Minister of Transport, our former colleague, uh, the Honourable Mark Garneau, really fixed the Navajo Waters Protection Act. Somehow or other, our former Minister of Environment, Catherine McKenna, was persuaded, and I believe by officials in her department, not to fix it. What the single biggest change that was made besides repealing the Environmental Assessment Act was to ditch criteria that tethered environmental assessment to areas of federal jurisdiction. They ditched if it's on federal land, involves federal money, or is under a permit given by the federal government. And instead, Stephen Harper's government created something called the quote unquote designated projects list. And the designated projects list could be anything the minister thought they wanted to put on a list. So it was project-based and not decision-based, and it could be anything at the minister's discretion. Now, that was SIA 2012. It meant that we went from having five to 6,000 federal projects a year reviewed, most by paper reviews that went quickly, changed that to fewer than 100 reviewed every year. You could see perhaps the attraction to people in the civil service not to go back to actually reviewing the federal projects every single year, but to keep it to fewer than 100. Somehow, the federal government, under former Minister Catherine McKenna, put forward Bill C-69 and decided to reject the advice of the expert environmental assessment panel under former chair of the BAP, Joanne Gelina, rejected all their advice, kept the key elements that Stephen Harper had put in place, which was that the Environmental Assessment Agency was no longer responsible for many assessments, but that regulatory bodies like the National Energy Board, now the Canadian Energy Regulator, or the Offshore Petroleum Boards, or the Canada Nuclear Safety Commission would do their environmental assessments separately. And they also got rid of the idea that we're tethered strongly to federal jurisdiction. It remained discretionary. That's why I voted against Bill C-69. Former Alberta Premier, uh, former Alberta Premier Jason Kenney said, well, this is the Anti-Pipeline Act. I said, look, it's completely discretionary to the minister. In a different government, this is the Pro-Pipeline Act. But where's the routing to federal jurisdiction? Where's the commitment to review everything the federal government does to make sure we've considered its environmental impacts? Those were all thrown out the window. So I may have been the only one in, well, in the pro-environmental assessment community, I don't think I was the only one, who actually cheered October 13th, 2023, when the Supreme Court of Canada said, you know what, this designated projects list is actually a ultra virus the federal government. It's just asking a minister to say what project they want on a list, but it isn't rooted in federal jurisdiction the way it had been from 1975 under a guidelines order to 1993 when it became law, right up until 2012 and Bill C-38 when Harper repealed it. And then for some crazy reason, and I use the word crazy advisedly because I don't know the reason, Mr. Speaker, I'm not referring to anyone in particular, but honestly, how could the Liberals have decided to keep the designated project list, which is the part that the reference decision of the Supreme Court of Canada said is ultra virus to federal government, and now stuffed in an omnibus budget bill that we were told we'd never see, we get amendments to the Environmental Assessment Act that keep the designated projects list. I don't think this new version in Bill C-69 redux 
is going to get Supreme Court of Canada approval, and I know it will not get environmental assessments for projects across this country that need to be assessed. It won't get environmental assessment for Highway 413. It won't get environmental assessment for things that are squarely within federal jurisdiction. What it will do is be a quick and dirty fix that only goes to the Finance Committee for study. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I close my opening remarks with what I can only describe as disgust. Uh, before we go to questions and comments, I just want to remind honourable members that when we are speaking uh, to uh, save the ears of our interpreters, not to bang on our desk when our microphones, our microphones are on. Question uh, Kamal Tire. Questions and comments. Honourable uh, Deputy de Beauport Limoilou. The honourable member for Beauport Limoilou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, my colleague knows that for several years there's been an increase in air pollution. And because of that, there's also been an increase in pulmonary, cardiac, and other health issues. That has also led to an increase in the costs of health care. Because of this increase in air pollution, and yet despite that, the federal government is not responding to Quebec and provincial requests to increase the health care transfers. And additionally, the federal government is continuing to subsidize the oil and gas industry. Doesn't my colleague find that Canada is a bit backwards in terms of what people really need? Honorable Member for Saanich Gulf Island. I'd like to thank my colleague from the Bloc, Quebecois. For the question, it is ironic that the government is continuing with the subsidies to fossil fuel industries, despite promises made to um, cancel these. For instance, we're looking at a budget of $34 billion for the Trans Mountain Pipeline project against our efforts to protect the climate and also against the public health interests of our population and against uh, the principle of protecting our population against pollution. So we can do more and we can take better decisions and wiser decisions, but not with this bill. In comments, I guess you come on there, the Honourable Member for King Vaughan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my Honourable Colleague. Uh, I have a question for her, um, because I've been hearing this a lot in my constituency. After nine years of this Prime Minister, one in ten people in Toronto have relied on food banks, food banks and more than half are $200 away from missing bills. This crisis is getting worse and worse every day. I spoke to Vishali from Saidam Food Bank recently, and his numbers are increasing at a more rapid pace than he can afford to supply for individuals, including seniors, up to 4,000 <coughs> baskets are being delivered each and every month to our senior population who just cannot afford the price of food. This inflationary budget is not helping our communities. What does she think of that situation and the inflationary spending of this wasteful government? Thank you. The Honourable Member for Senate Gulf Islands. Thank you. And I thank my honourable friend from King Vaughan. We may not agree on the details of this. I think there's no question but that Canadians are facing an affordability crisis. We do need, actually, though, to spend the money it takes to alleviate that affordability crisis, because what we've seen over the last number of decades is a growing gap between the very wealthy and the poor, and to the, a growing number of people who wouldn't have considered themselves poor, had been in the middle class, had incomes, and no longer can fill a grocery cart. I think it's a really important thing to have a school meal program. I think that will help alleviate some of the strain on families. I think we have to recognize that the inflationary impacts of post-pandemic life and breaking of supply chains have affected more than just Canada. So I think we need to address this as an affordability crisis and come up with solutions that really work. Green Party believes one of those is a basic and livable annual income. 
Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for, or the Honourable Deputy House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so uh, I listened to that last exchange uh, um, between my colleague and um, the, um, the member from Sandscoff Islands, and she said that she thought it was important to have a national school food program. And uh, this budget provides for that. So obviously she supports that element of it. Um, I didn't hear or I didn't quite decipher whether or not Conservatives support or uh, sorry, the Green Party is going to vote in favour of this budget or they're not. So my first question is, uh, are they going to vote for it? And if the answer is no, how does she justify voting against the budget given that there are some elements to it that she very much does support, such as the National School Food Program? The Honourable Member for Senate Gulf Islands. I appreciate the uh, Honourable Government House Le Deputy House Leader asking me the question. I'll be very clear. We're uh, the Green Party, and it, we don't always vote the same way. My colleague from Kitchener Centre and I discuss every issue. We are governed by what we think our constituents would want us to do. But a budget vote is the ultimate vote of confidence in government. And as much as I would like to, for the elements I like within this budget, and I passionately believe in a school meal program, preferably local food, and preferably helping our young people know how it is to farm and grow their own food and have it served in a local school. But I can't, in good conscience, I can't vote for a budget that, that will further wreck our environmental assessment process. I can't vote for a budget that doesn't take the climate crisis seriously, and I can't vote confidence in a government that has put $34 billion into building a pipeline that puts my entire community and our entire ecoregion around the Salish Sea at grave risk. Reprise,